Let's talk about dutiable status of goods. Let's start with understanding what a customs duty is. Customs duty is a tariff or tax imposed on goods when transported across international borders. The purpose of customs duty is to protect each country's economy, residents, jobs, environment, etc. by controlling the flow of goods, especially restrictive and prohibited goods into and out of the country. Dutiable refers to articles on which customs duty may have to be paid. Each article has a specific duty rate, which is determined by a number of factors. What are rates of duty? All goods imported into the United States are subject to duty or duty-free entry in accordance with their classification under the applicable items in the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States. The rate of duties depends on 1. Where you acquired the article. 2. Where it was made and 3. What is it made of? What is the Harmonized Tariff System, or HTS? The HTS provides duty rates for virtually every existing item. Customs uses the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States Annotated, or HTSUS, for short. The HTSUS is a reference manual that provides the applicable tariff rates and statistical categories for all merchandise imported into the U.S. When goods are dutiable, ad valorem, specific, or compound rates may be assessed. An ad valorem rate, which is the type of rate most often applied, is a percentage of the value of the merchandise, such as 5% ad valorem. A specific rate is a specified amount per unit of weight or other quantity, such as 5.9 cents per dozen. A compound rate is a combination of both an ad valorem rate and a specific rate, such as 0.7 cents per kilogram plus 10% ad valorem. Rates of duty for imported merchandise may also vary depending upon the country of origin. Most merchandise is dutiable under the most favored nation, now referred to as normal trade relations. Merchandise from countries to which rates have not been extended is dutiable at the full or statutory rates. Duty-free status is also available under various conditional exemptions, which are reflected in the special column under Column 1 of the tariff schedule. It is the importer's burden to show eligibility for a conditional exemption from duty. One of the more frequently applied exemptions from duty occurs under the Generalized System of Preferences, or GSP. GSP-eligible merchandise qualifies for duty-free entry when it is from a beneficiary developing country and meets other requirements. We'll talk more about these requirements in later sections. Other exemptions include certain personal exemptions, exemptions for articles for scientific or other institutional purposes, and exemptions for returned American goods. Let's talk about articles from duty-free shops. Duty-free shop articles sold in a customs duty-free shop are free, only for the country in which the shop is located. Therefore, if you acquired articles that exceed your personal exemption or allowance, the articles you purchased in customs duty-free shop, whether in the U.S. or abroad, will be subject to customs duty upon entering your destination country. Articles purchased in an American customs duty-free shop are also subject to U.S. customs duty if you bring them into the U.S. For example, if you buy alcoholic beverages in a customs duty-free shop in New York before entering Canada and then bring them back into the U.S., they will be subject to customs duty and internal revenue service tax or IRT. Let's talk about the ruling on imports. The customs service makes its decision on the dutiable status of merchandise when the entry is liquidated after the entry documents have been filed. When advance information is needed, do not depend on a small trial or test shipment since there is no guarantee that the next shipment will receive the same tariff treatment. Small importations may slip by, particularly if they are processed under informal procedures that apply to small shipments or in circumstances warranting application of a flat rate. 
An exporter, importer, or other interested party may get advance information on any matter affecting the dutiable status of merchandise by writing to the port director where the merchandise will be entered, or to the director at the National Commodity Specialist Division. While you will find that, for many purposes, customs ports are your best sources of information, informal information obtained on tariff classifications is not binding. The importing public may obtain a binding tariff classification ruling, which can be relied upon for placing, or, accepting orders, or, for making other business determinations, by writing to the director at the National Commodity Specialist Division. The ruling will be binding at all ports of entry unless revoked by the Customs Services Office of Regulation and Ruling. The following information is required in ruling requests. 1. The names, addresses, and other identifying information of all interested parties, if known, and the manufacturer ID code, if known. 2. The names of the ports at which the merchandise will be entered, if known. 3. A description of the transaction, for example, a prospective importation of certain merchandise and from certain country. For a statement that there are, to the importer's knowledge, no issues on the commodity pending before the customs service or any court. 5. A statement as to whether classification advice has previously been sought from a customs officer, and if so, from whom, and what advice was rendered, if any. A request for tariff classification should include the following information. 1. A complete description of the goods. Send samples, if practical, sketches, diagrams, or other illustrative material that will be useful in supplementing the written description. 2. Cost breakdown of component materials and their respective quantities shown in percentages, if possible. 3. A description of the principal use of the goods, as a class or kind of merchandise, in the United States. For information as to commercial, scientific or common designations, as may be applicable. 5. Any other information that may be pertinent or required for the purpose of tariff classification. To avoid delays, your request should be as complete as possible. If you send a sample, do not rely on it to tell the whole story. Also, please note that samples may be subjected to laboratory analysis, which is done free of charge. Clearly, however, if a sample is destroyed during laboratory analysis, it cannot be returned. Information submitted and incorporated in response to a request for a customs decision may be disclosed or withheld in accordance with the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Let's talk about protest. The importer may disagree with the dutiable status after the entry has been liquidated. A decision at this stage of the entry transaction is requested by filing a protest and application for further review on Customs Form 19 within 90 days after liquidation. If the Customs Service denies a protest, dutiable status may then be determined through litigation against the government. Let's talk about liability of duties. There is no provision under which U.S. duties and taxes may be prepaid in a foreign country before exportation to the U.S. This is true even for gifts sent by mail. In the usual case, liability for the payments of duty become fixed at the time an entry for consumption or for warehouse is filed with customs. The obligation for payment is upon the person or firm in whose name the entry is filed. When goods have been entered for warehouse, liability for paying duties may be transferred to any person who purchases the goods and desires to withdraw them in his or her own name. Paying a customs broker will not relieve the importer of his or liability for customs charges, such as duties, taxes, and other debts owed customs, should those charges not be paid by the broker. Therefore, if the importer pays the broker by check, he or she should give the broker a separate check, made payable to the U.S. Customs Service for those customs charges, which the broke will then deliver to customs. If the entry is made in the name of a customs broker, the broker may obtain relief from statutory liability for the payment of increased 
or additional duties found due if 1. The actual owner of the goods is named and 2. The owner's declaration, whereby the owner agrees to pay the additional duty and the owner's bond are both filed by the broker with the port director within 90 days of the date of entry. The customs service designated such items as lift vans, cargo vans, shipping tanks, pallets and certain articles used to ship goods internationally as instruments of international traffic. So long as this designation applies, these articles are not subject to entry or duty when they arrive, whether they are loaded or empty. Other classes of merchandise containers may also be designated as instruments of international traffic upon application to the Commission of Customs for such a designation. If any article so designated is diverted to domestic use however, it must be entered and duty paid, if applicable. Container specially shaped or fitted to contain a specific article or set of articles suitable for long-term use and entered with the articles for which they are intended are classifiable with the accompanying articles if they are of a kind normally sold therewith. Examples of such containers are camera cases, musical instrument cases, gun cases, drawing instrument cases, and necklace cases. This rule does not apply to containers that give the importation as a whole its essential character. Subject to the above rule, packing materials and packing containers entered with goods packed in them are classified with these goods if they are of a kind normally used for packing such goods. However, this does not apply to packing materials or containers that are clearly suitable for repetitive use. Now, we are going to talk about the temporary free importation. Let's begin with the discussion about the temporary importation under bond, or TIB for short. Certain types of goods may be admitted into the United States under bond, without the payment of duty, if they are not imported for sale, or for sale, but upon approval. These goods must be exported within one year from the date of importation. Generally, the amount of the bond is double the estimated duties. The one-year period for exportation may, upon application to the port director, be extended for one or more further periods which, when added to the initial one year, shall not exceed a total of three years. There is an exception in the case of certain types of merchandise, which we will discuss momentarily, the period of the bond may not exceed six months and may not be extended. Merchandise entered under TIB must be exported before expiration of the bond period or any extension to avoid assessment of liquidated damages in the amount of the bond. All goods entered under TIB are subject to quota compliance. Classes of goods that may be imported under TIB 1. Merchandise to be repaired, altered, or processed including process which result in an article being manufactured or produced in the United States, provided that the following conditions are met. a. The merchandise will not be processed into an article manufactured or produced in the United States if the articles is 1. Alcohol, distilled spirits, wine, beer, or any dilution or mixture of these, 2. Perfume or other commodity containing ethyl alcohol, whether denatured or not, 3. A product of wheat. B. If merchandise is processed and results in an article being manufactured or produced in the United States other than those described above, 1. A complete accounting will be made to the Customs Service for all articles, wastes, and irrecoverable losses resulting from the processing, and 2. All articles will be exported or destroyed under Customs supervision within the bonded period. Valuable waste must also be exported or so destroyed unless duty, if applicable, is paid. 2. Models of women's wearing apparel, imported by manufacturers for use solely as models, in their own establishments, these articles require quota compliance. 3. Articles imported by illustrators and photographers for use, solely as models in their own establishments, to illustrate catalogs, pamphlets, or advertising matter. For samples solely for use in taking orders for merchandise, these samples require quota compliance. 5. 
articles solely for examination with a view to reproduction, or for examination and reproduction, except photo-engraved printing plates for examination and reproduction and motion picture advertising films. 6. Articles intended solely for testing, experimental, or review purposes, including plans, specifications, drawings, blueprints, photographs, and articles for use in connection with experiments or for study. If articles under this category are destroyed in connection with the experiment or study, proof of such destruction must be presented to satisfy the obligation under the bond to export the articles. 7. Automobiles, motorcycles, bicycles, airplanes, airships, balloons, boats, racing shells, and similar vehicles and craft, and the usual equipment of the foregoing if brought temporarily into the United States by non-residents for the purpose of taking part in races or other specific contests. Port directors may defer the expiration of the bond for a period not to exceed 90 days after the date of importation for vehicles and craft to take part in races or other specific contests for other than money purposes. If the vehicle or craft is not exported, or the bond is not given within the period for such deferment, the vehicle or craft shall be subject to forfeiture. 8. Locomotives and other railroad equipment brought temporarily into the United States for use in clearing obstructions, fighting fires, or making emergency repairs on railroads within the United States, or for use in transportation otherwise than in international traffic, when the Secretary of the Treasury finds that temporary use of foreign railroad equipment is necessary to meet an emergency. Importers can expedite approval of a request for temporary importation to meet an emergency by including evidence of the existence of the emergency, such as news reports. 9. Containers from congested gases, filled or empty, and containers or other articles used for covering or holding merchandise, including personal or household effects, during transportation and suitable for reuse for that purpose. 10. Professional equipment, tools of trade, repair components for equipment or tools admitted under this item, and camping equipment imported be, or for non-residents for the non-residents use, while sojourning temporarily in the United States. 11. Articles of special design for temporary use exclusively, in connection with the manufacture or production of articles for export. 12. Animals and poultry brought into the United States for the purpose of breeding, exhibition, or competition for prizes, and the usual equipment therefore. 13. Works of free fine arts, drawings, engravings, photographic pictures, and philosophical and scientific apparatus brought into the United States by professional artists, lecturers, or scientists arriving from abroad, for use by them for exhibition and in illustration, promotion, and encouragement of art, science, or industry in the United States. 14. Automobiles, automobile chassis, automobile bodies, cutaway portions of any of the foregoing and parts for any of the foregoing, finished, unfinished, or cutaway, when intended solely for show purposes. These articles may be admitted only on condition that the Secretary of the Treasury has found that the foreign country, from which the articles were imported, allows, or will allow, substantially reciprocal privileges with respect to similar exports to that country from the United States. If the Secretary finds that a foreign country has discontinued, or will discontinue the allowance for such privileges, the privileges under this item shall not apply thereafter to import from that country. Relief from liability under bond may be obtained in any case in which the articles are destroyed under customs supervision in lieu of exportation within the original bond period. However, in the case of articles entered for testing, experimenting, etc., as specified in number 6 as we just discussed, destruction need not be under customs supervision where articles are destroyed during the course of the experiments or tests during the bond period or any law extension. Satisfactory proof of destruction shall be furnished to the port of director with whom the custom entry is filed. Now, let's talk about ATA carnet or temporary admission. 
ATA stands for the Combined French and English Words Admission Temporaire or Temporary Admission. ATA Carnet is an international customs document that may be used for the temporary duty-free importation of certain goods into a country in lieu of the usual customs documents required. The Carnet serves as a guarantee against the payment of customs duties that may become due on goods temporarily imported and not re-export. Quota compliance is required on merchandise subject to quota, for example, textiles are subject to quota and visa requirements. A carnet is valid for one year. The traveler or business person, however, may make as many trips as desired during the period the carnet is valid, provided he or she has sufficient pages for each stop. The United States currently allows ATA carnets to be used for the temporary admission of professional equipment, commercial samples, and advertising material. Most other countries allow the use of carnets for the temporary admission of these goods and, in some cases, other uses of the ATA carnet are permitted. Local carnet associations, as members of the International Bureau of the Paris-based International Chamber of Commerce, issue carnets to their residents. These associations guarantee the payment of duties to local customs authorities should goods imported under cover of foreign-issued carnet not be re-export. In the United States, the U.S. Council of the International Chamber of Commerce has been designated by U.S. Customs as the United States Issuing and Guaranteeing Organization. A fee is charged by the Council for its service. Let's talk about the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and importing issues related to NAFTA members. NAFTA was an agreement signed by Canada, Mexico, and the United States that created a trilateral trade bloc in North America. The agreement came into force January 1, 1994, and superseded the 1988 Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement between the United States and Canada. Essentially, NAFTA established a free trade zone in North America. It immediately lifted tariffs on the majority of goods produced by the signatory nations. It also calls for the gradual elimination, over a period of 15 years, of most remaining barriers to cross-border investment and to the movement of goods and services among the three countries. We are not going to discuss the NAFTA in its entirety because that would exceed the scope of this course. In fact, we have a separate course on NAFTA itself. If you are interested in the NAFTA and all the new developments with NAFTA under the Trump administration, you can enroll for that course. The NAFTA eliminates tariffs on most goods originating in Canada, Mexico, and the United States over a maximum transition period of 15 years. Under the schedule to eliminate duties previously established in the Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement, goods originating in Canada have been free of duty since 1998. For most Mexico-United States and Canada-Mexico trade, the NAFTA will either eliminate existing customs duties immediately or phase them out in 5 to 10 years. On a few sensitive items, the agreement will phase out tariffs over 15 years. NAFTA member countries may agree to a faster phase-out of tariffs on any goods. During the transition period, rates of duties will vary, depending upon which NAFTA country the goods were produced in. That is, the NAFTA may grant Canadian goods entering the United States a different NAFTA rate than the same Mexican goods entering the United States. For most goods imported into Canada, there will be three NAFTA rates. The rate depends on whether the goods are of U.S. origin, Mexican origin, or produced jointly with U.S. and Mexican inputs. Generally, tariffs will only be eliminated on goods that originate as defined by Article 401 of the NAFTA. That is, transshipping goods made in another country through Mexico or Canada will not entitle them to preferential NAFTA rates of duty. The NAFTA does provide for reduced duties on some goods of Canada, Mexico, and the United States that do not originate there, but that meets specified conditions outlined in the agreement. The NAFTA grants benefits to a variety of goods that originate in the region. 
Originating is a term used to describe those goods that meet the requirements of Article 401 of the agreement. Articles 401 of the agreement defines originating in four ways. 1. Goods wholly obtained or produced entirely in the NAFTA region. 2. Goods produced entirely in the NAFTA region exclusively from originating materials. 3. Goods meeting a specific Annex 401 origin rule. For unassembled goods and goods classified with their parts, which do not meet the Annex 401 rule of origin, but contain 60% regional value content, using the transaction method, 50% using the net cost method. Goods that qualify as originating will lose that status if they subsequently undergo any operation outside the NAFTA region, other than unloading, reloading, or any other operation necessary to preserve in good condition or to transport the goods to Canada, Mexico, or the United States. Let's talk about entry procedures under the NAFTA. Existing entry procedure will continue to be used under the NAFTA. As with other trade reference programs, importers must claim NAFTA benefits to receive preferential duty treatment. In the United States, a claim is made by For formal entries 1. Add MX or CA to the tariff classification number 2. Signing the Customs Form 7501 or Entry Summary For informal entries the U.S. does not require a certificate of origin for entries valued at U.S. $2,500 or less. For commercial shipments, however, the invoice accompanying the importation must include a statement certifying that the goods qualify as originating goods. Article 502 of the NAFTA requires that an importer base his claims on the exporter's written certificate of origin. This may be U.S.-approved CF-434, Certificate of Origin, the Canadian Certificate of Origin, Canadian Form B-232, or the Mexican Certificate of Origin, or Certificado de Origen. This certificate may cover a single shipment, or may be utilized as a blanket declaration for a period of 12 months. In either case, the certificate must be in the importer's possession when making the claim. NAFTA Annex 401, Origin Criteria for Textiles and Apparel Products, ensures that most of the production relating to textiles and apparel occurs in North America. The basic origin rule for textiles and apparel is yarn forward. This means that the yarn used to form the fabric must originate in a NAFTA country. Let's talk the Generalized Systems of Preferences, or GSP for short. GSP is a program providing for free rates of duty for certain merchandise from beneficiary developing independent countries and dependent countries and territories to encourage their economic growth. This program was enacted by the United States in the Trade Act of 1974. It occasionally expires and must be renewed by Congress to remain in effect. The Customs Service will provide the trade community with notification of these expirations and renewals. The GSP eligibility list contains a wide range of products, classifiable under more than 4,000 different subheadings in the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States. These items are identified either by an A or A asterisk in the Special Column, under Column 1, of the Tariff Schedule. Merchandise classifiable under a subheading designated in this manner may qualify for duty-free entry if imported into the United States directly from any of the designated countries and territories. Merchandise from one or more of these countries, however, may be excluded from the exemption if there is an A asterisk in the special column. The list of countries and exclusions, as well as GSP-eligible articles, will change from time to time over the life of the program. The latest edition of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States will contain the most current information. For commercial shipments requiring a formal entry, a claim for duty-free status is made under GSP by showing on the entry summary that the country of origin is a designated beneficiary developing country and by showing an A 
with the appropriate GSP eligible subheading. Eligible merchandise will be entitled to duty-free treatment provided the following conditions are met. 1. The merchandise must have been produced in a beneficiary country. This requirement is satisfied whether a. The goods are wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of a beneficiary country, or b. The goods have been substantially transformed into a new or different article of commerce in a beneficiary country. 2. The merchandise must be imported directly from any beneficiary country into the customs territory of the United States. 3. The cost or value of materials produced in the beneficiary developing country and or the direct cost of processing performed there must represent at least 35% of the appraised value of the goods. The cost or value of materials imported into the beneficiary developing country may be included in calculating the 35% value-added requirement for an eligible article if the materials are first substantially transformed into a new or different article and are then used as constituent materials in the production of the eligible article. The phrase direct costs of processing includes costs directly incurred or reasonably allocated to the processing of the article such as the cost of all actual labor, dyes, molds, tooling, depreciation on machinery, research and development, and inspection and testing. Business overhead, administrative expenses, salaries, and profit, as well as general business expenses such as administrative salaries, casualty and liability insurance, advertising and salesman salaries, are not considered direct costs of processing. Let's talk about the Caribbean Basin Initiative, or CBI for short. The CBI is a program providing for the duty-free entry of certain merchandise from designated beneficiary countries or territories. This program was enacted by the United States as the Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery Act. It became effective on January 1, 1984, and has no expiration date. The list of beneficiaries may change from time to time over the life of the program. Most products from designated beneficiaries may be eligible for CBI duty-free treatment. These items are identified by either an E or E asterisk in the special column under column 1 of the harmonized tariff schedule. Merchandise classification under a subheading designated in this manner may qualify for duty-free entry if imported into the United States directly from any of the designated countries and territories. Merchandise from one or more of these countries, however, may be excluded from time to time over the life of the program. Merchandise will be eligible for CBI duty-free treatment only if the following conditions are met. 1. For commercial shipments requiring a formal entry, a claim for preferential tariff treatment under CBI is made by showing that the country of origin is a designated beneficiary country and by inserting the letter E as a prefix to the applicable tariff schedule number on Customs Form 7501. 2. The merchandise must have been produced in a beneficiary country. This requirement is satisfied whether a. The goods are wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of a beneficiary country, or b. The goods have been substantially transformed into a new or different article of commerce in a beneficiary country. 3. The merchandise must be imported directly from any beneficiary country into the customs territory of the United States. 4. At least 35% of the appraised value of the article imported into the United States must consist of the cost or value of materials produced in one or more beneficiary countries and or the direct costs of processing operations performed in one or more beneficiary countries. The Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are defined as beneficiary countries for purposes of this requirement, therefore, value attributable to Puerto Rico or to the Virgin Islands may also be counted. In addition, the cost or value of materials produced in the customs territory of the United States, other than Puerto Rico, may be counted toward the 35% value-added requirement, but only to a maximum of 15%, 
of the appraised value of the imported article. The cost or value of materials imported into a beneficiary country from a non-beneficiary country may be included in calculating the 35% value-added requirement for an eligible article if the materials are first substantially transformed into new or different articles of commerce and are then used as constituent materials in the production of the eligible article. The phase direct costs of processing operations includes costs directly incurred or reasonably allocated to the production of the article, such as the cost of actual labor, dyes, molds, tooling, depreciation of machinery, research and development, inspection and testing. Business overhead, administrative expenses and profit, as well as general business expenses, such as casualty and liability insurance, advertising, and salespeople's salaries, are not considered direct costs of processing operations. In addition to the origin rules we have talked about, the Customs and Trade Act of 1990 added new criteria for duty-free eligibility under the Caribbean Basin Initiative. First, articles which are the growth, product, or manufacture of Puerto Rico and which subsequently are processed in a CBI beneficiary country, may also receive duty-free treatment when entered if the three following conditions are met. 1. They are imported directly from a beneficiary country into the customs territory of the United States. 2. They are advanced in value or improved in condition by any means in a beneficiary country. And 3. Any materials added to the article in a beneficiary country must be a product of a beneficiary country or the U.S. Second, articles that are assembled or processed in whole from U.S. components or ingredients other than water in a beneficiary country may be entered free of duty. Duty-free treatment will apply if the components or ingredients are exported directly to the beneficiary country and the finished article is imported directly into the customs territory of the United States. Now, let's talk about the Andean Trade Preference Act. The Andean Trade Preference Act, or ATPA, was enacted in 1991 to combat drug production and trafficking in the Andean countries such as Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. The program offers trade benefits to help these countries develop and strengthen legitimate industries. The ATPA was expanded under the Trade Act of 2002 and is now called the Andean Trade Promotion and Drug Eradication Act. It provides duty-free access to U.S. markets for approximately 5,600 products. So, which items or categories of items are eligible under the ATPA? Most products from the designated countries may be eligible for duty-free treatment. Products that are statutorily excluded include textile and apparel articles, which are subject to textile agreements, some footwear, preserved tuna in airtight containers, petroleum products, watches and watch parts from countries subject to column 2 rates of duty, various sugar products, rum and taffia, Eligible items are identified by either a J or J asterisk in the special subcolumn under column 1 of the harmonized tariff schedule. Merchandise classifiable under a subheading designated in this manner may qualify for duty-free entry if imported into the United States directly from any designated beneficiary country. Merchandise from one or more of these countries, however, may be excluded from duty-free treatment if there is J asterisk in the special subcolumn. Now, let's briefly discuss the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Area Agreement. The United States-Israel Free Trade Area Agreement, or FTA, for short, is a program originally enacted to provide for duty-free treatment of merchandise produced in Israel to stimulate trade between the two countries. This program was authorized by the United States in the Trade and Tariff Act of 1984. It has no termination date. The FTA Implementation Act was amended on October 2, 1996, authorizing the President to implement certain changes affecting the duty status of goods from the West Bank 
Gaza Strip, and Qualifying Industrial Zones, QIZs. A QIZ is defined as any area that 1. Encompasses portions of the territory of Israel and Jordan or Israel and Egypt. 2. Has been designated by local authorities as an enclave where merchandise may enter without payment of duty or excise taxes, and 3. Has been designated by the United States Trade Representative, USTR, in a notice published in the Federal Register as a QIZ. The trade community should contact local customs port for a current list of designated QIZs. The FTA relates to most tariff items listed in the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States. These items are identified as IL in the special column, under Column 1, of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule. If a claim for duty-free or reduced duty rates is being made for commercial shipments of Israeli goods covered by a formal entry, the Harmonized Tariff Schedule subheading must be prefixed with an IL on Customs Form 7501, Entry Document, or Customs Form 7505, Warehouse Withdrawal Document, as appropriate. What is considered a product of Israel? An article imported into the customs territory of the United States is eligible for treatment as product of Israel if 1. The merchandise has been produced in Israel. This requirement is satisfied when a. The goods are wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of Israel. Or b. The goods have been substantially transformed into a new or different article of commerce in Israel. 2. That article is imported directly from Israel, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or a QIZ, in the customs territory of the United States. 3. The sum of a. The cost or value of the materials produced in Israel, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or a QIZ, plus 2. The direct costs of processing operations performed in Israel, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or a QIZ, is not less than 35% of the appraised value of such article at the time it is entered. If the cost or value of materials produced in the customs territory of the United States is included with respect to an eligible article, an amount not to exceed 15% of the appraised value of the article at the time it is entered, that is attributable to such United States cost or value, may be applied toward determining the 35%. No article may be considered to meet these requirements by virtue of having undergone 1. Simple combining or packaging operations or 2. Mere diluting with water or another substance that does not materially alter the characteristics of the article. The phrase direct costs of processing operations includes, but is not limited to 1. All actual labor costs involved in the growth, production, manufacture, or assembly of the specific merchandise, including fringe benefits, on-the-job training, and the costs of engineering supervisory, quality control, and similar personnel. 2. Dyes, molds, tooling and depreciation on machinery and equipment, which are allocable to the specific merchandise. Direct costs of processing operation do not include costs which are not directly attributable to the merchandise concerned or are not costs of manufacturing the product, such as 1. Profit and 2. General expenses of doing business, which are either not allocable to the specific merchandise or are not related to the growth, production, manufacture, or assembly of the merchandise, such as administrative salaries, casualty and liability insurance, advertising, and sales staff salaries. Commission or Expenses Certificate of Origin, Form A, must be included with all formal entries. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, Certificate of Origin Form A is used as documentary evidence to support duty-free and reduced rate claim for Israel articles covered by a formal entry. It does not have to be produced at the time of entry, however, unless so requested by the Customs Service. The Form A may be presented on an entry-by-entry -entry basis, or may be used as a blanket declaration for a period of 12 months. 
The Form A can be obtained from the Israeli Authorizing Issuing Authority or from UNCTAD. For informal entries, the Form A is not required for commercial or non-commercial shipments. However, the port director may require such other evidence of the country of origin as deemed necessary. With regard to merchandise accompanying the traveler, it should be noted that, in order to avoid delays to passengers, the inspecting customs officer will extend Israel duty-free or reduced rate treatment to all eligible articles when satisfied from the facts available that the merchandise concerned in a product of Israel. In such cases, Form A is not required for the merchandise. Let's move on to the U.S. Jordan Free Trade Area Agreement. The United States-Jordan Free Trade Area Agreement was signed into law in September 2001. It provides for the elimination of duties and commercial barriers in the trade of goods and services that originate in the United States and Jordan. Under the agreement, a good qualifies for preferential tariff treatment as a product of Jordan only if a. it is imported directly from Jordan into the United States and is wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of Jordan or b. it is imported directly from Jordan into the United States and is a new or different article of commerce that has been grown, produced, or manufactured in Jordan and c. The sum of 1. The cots or value of the materials produced in Jordan plus 2. The direct cost of processing operations performed in Jordan in not less than 35% of the appraised value of the article at the time it is entered into the territory of the U.S. d. If the cost or value of materials produced in the customs territory of the untied states is included for purposes of determining whether an article meets the requirement of containing 35% domestic content, no more than 15% of that article appraised value that is attributable to the United States cost or value at the time it is entered, may be applied toward determining the 35%. Simple combining or packaging operations, or mere dilution with water or another substance, is not sufficient to confer origin for purposes of this agreement. There is no exception from paying the merchandise processing fee provided for in the agreement. These fees must be paid on entries of merchandise for which the preferential tariff treatment claim is made under the agreement. Let's go over the U.S. Jordan Free Trade Area Agreement Textile and Apparel Articles Origin Rules. Pursuant to the provisions set forth in the agreement, a textile or apparel article imported directly from Jordan into the customs territory of the United States will be eligible for preferential tariff treatment only if the following conditions are met. 1. The article is wholly obtained or produced in Jordan. 2. The article is a yarn, thread, twine, cordage, rope, cable, or braiding, and a. The constituent stable fibers are spun in Jordan or b. The continuous filament is extruded in Jordan. 3. The article is a fabric, including fabric classified in Chapter 59 of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, and the constituent fibers, filaments, or yarns are woven, knitted, kneaded, tufted, felted, entangled, or transformed by other fabric-making process in Jordan or for it the article is any other textile or apparel article, that is wholly assembled in Jordan from its component pieces. Textile and apparel article not wholly obtained or produced in Jordan must comply with the above conditions and the value requirements described above under general origin rules. An article is wholly obtained or produced in Jordan if it is wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of Jordan. If preferential tariff treatment is claimed at the time of the entry, a written claim shall be filed on the entry document by placing the symbol J-O as a prefix to the HTS subheading for each article for which such treatment is claimed. The importer shall be prepared to submit to customs, upon request, a declaration setting for all pertinent information concerning the article's production or manufacture. This information must be retained in the importer's files for five years. The information on the declaration should contain at least the following. 1. 
a description of the article, quantity, numbers, and marks of packages, invoice, number, and bill of adding. 2. A description of the operations performed in the article's production in Jordan and the identification of the direct costs of processing operations. 3. A description or any materials used in the article's production that are wholly the growth, product, or manufacture of Jordan and a statement of the cost or value of these materials. 4. A description of the operations performed on and a statement as to the origin and cost or value of any foreign materials used in the article, which are claimed to have been sufficiently processed in Jordan, that they now qualify as materials produced in Jordan and 5. A description of the origin and cost or value of any foreign materials used in the article that were not substantially transformed in Jordan. The declaration shall be prepared, signed and upon request, submitted to the customs officer concerned. Customs may request the importer's declaration when verifying a claim's validity for preferential treatment under the agreement. In this case, the importer should be prepared to supply any and all supporting documentation upon which the declaration was based. The importer's failure to provide the declaration and or sufficient evidence documentation will result in the claim's denial. Okay. Let's move on to the next item on our list, the African Growth and Opportunity Act or AGOA. The African Growth and Opportunity Act or AGOA, for short, provides duty-free treatment to goods of designated Sub-Saharan African countries, or SSAs. The program dates from 2000 and has the goal of promoting economic growth through good governance and free markets. It covers non-textile as well as textile goods and was most recently reauthorized through September 2025. Some 5,240 tariff items are eligible for AGOA benefits. In order to benefit from AGOA, a good must be either wholly obtained, grown, fished, mined, etc., or sufficiently manufactured in an AGOA country. Sufficiently manufactured means that all third country materials have undergone a substantial transformation, and at least 35% of the good's value is added to the beneficiary country, with up to 15% of that value attributable to U.S. inputs. Additionally, the good must be imported directly. Let's now move on to another type of special duties, called the anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Anti-dumping and countervailing duties are types of additional duties used to offset the effects of two unfair trade practices that give imports an unfair advantage over competing U.S. goods. Anti-dumping duties are assessed on imported merchandise that is sold, or is likely to be sold, in the United States, at less than its fair value, that is less than the foreign market value of the merchandise. The foreign market value may be based on the price at which the merchandise is sold in the home market, or to third countries, or on a constructed value, based on cost, of a merchandise. Countervailing duties are assessed to counter subsidies provided to merchandise that is exported to the United States. In addition to being subsidized or sold at less than fair value, the imported merchandise must also injure a U.S. industry, except for subsidized products from certain countries that are not entitled to an injury determination. The Department of Commerce, the International Trade Commission, or ITC, and the U.S. Customs Service, all play a part in enforcing laws related anti-dumping, or AD for short, and countervailing duty, or CVD for short. The Commerce Department is also responsible for their general administration. It determines whether the merchandise is sold at less than fair value or is subsidized. It also determines the amount of duties that must be assessed. The ITC makes the injury determinations. The Customs Service assesses the duties once Commerce and the ITC have made the necessary determination. Establishing and assessing both kinds of duties occurs during the following processes. First, the investigation. Although they may be initiated by the Commerce Department, AD and CVD investigations are usually initiated as the result of A. 
petition from a domestic industry or other interested party such as a trade union or industry association. The party must simultaneously file the petition with the Commerce Department and the ITC, the latter if an injury test is required. If the necessary elements are present in the petition, the Commerce Department and the ITC will initiate separate investigations. The investigations then continue with a series of preliminary and final determination that, if appropriate, result in an order and the eventual assessment of AD and CDD duties. Our discussion here is based on the assumption that the injury test is required. If not, the outcome of the consideration is based solely upon the Commerce Department determinations. The ITC makes the first preliminary determination concerning the likelihood of injury. If that determination is negative, the investigations are terminated. If it is affirmative, the Commerce Department then issues a preliminary determination with respect to the sales and or subsidy issues. Later, based upon further review and comments received in the case, the Commerce Department issues a final determination. If either of these Commerce Department determination is affirmative, Commerce will direct Customs to suspend liquidation of entries for merchandise subject to investigation and to require cash deposit or bond equal to the amount of estimated dumping margin. That is, the differential between the fair market value and the U.S. price or the net subsidy. After the final determination by the Commerce Department, the ITC then follows with its final injury determination. If the ITC's final determination is also affirmative, the Commerce Department issues an AD or CVD order. At that time, Commerce directs customs to require with very limited exception for new shippers, cash deposits of estimated duties. A negative final determination either by Commerce or ITC would terminate the investigations. Both agencies announce their determinations, including orders and the results of the administration reviews in the Federal Register. Each year, in the anniversary month of the order, interested parties have the opportunity to request a review of the order with respect to individual producers or resellers covered by the order. The period of review is usually the 12 months preceding the anniversary month. However, the first review period also includes any term prior to the normal 12-month period for which the suspension of liquidation was directed. If no review is requested, Commerce will direct Customs to collect deposit and assess duties in the amount of the cash or bond rate in effect on the date of entry and to continue to require deposits at that rate for future entries. If a review is requested, Commerce carries out a review similar to its original investigation and issues revised rates for assessment and deposits. Upon receipt of instruction from the Commerce Department, Customs will collect duties and liquidate entries as directed. Let's now talk about drawback or refunds of duties. The term drawback refers to a refund of 99% of the duties or taxes collected on imported merchandise because certain legal or regulatory requirements have been met. To qualify for drawback and importation of merchandise and subsequent exportation or destruction of merchandise must occur. The purpose of the drawback program is to assist American importers, manufacturers, and exporters to compete in international markets by allowing them to obtain refunds of duties paid on imported merchandise. There are three primary types of drawback manufacturing drawback and used merchandise drawback and rejected merchandise drawback. Manufacturing drawback is a refund of duties paid on imported merchandise used in the manufacture of articles that are either exported or destroyed. The imported merchandise must be used in manufacture and exported within five years from the date of importation of the merchandise. An approved drawback ruling, formerly called a drawback contract, must be on file with customs before any manufacturing drawback claims are filed. An used merchandise drawback is a refund of duties paid on imported merchandise that is exported or destroyed without undergoing manufacture 
and is never used in the United States. The imported merchandise must be exported within three years from the date of importation of the merchandise. Lastly, the rejected merchandise drawback is refund of duties on imported merchandise that is exported because it did not conform to sample or specifications or was shipped without the consent of the consignee. Merchandise must be returned to customs custody within three years of the date of its importation in order to qualify for this type of drawback. Rejected merchandise must be exported and cannot be destroyed in lieu of such exportation. These drawback claims involve a refund of 99% of the duties that were paid upon importation. That concludes our discussion on assessment of duty. In the next section, we will discuss classification and value of imported merchandise.